Hello and welcome to Rob from the Internet Talks About Beer, a show where we discuss different styles of beer, beer history, beer flavor profiles. We give shout outs to breweries we think make exceptional beer and we talk about whatever else comes to mind during the course of the conversation. I'm Rob from the Internet. And if you like this uh, style of, uh, I don't know, I guess, edutainment that I'm doing, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you'd subscribe to the channel, maybe click the little bell to be notified uh, when new episodes come out, or just share it with your friends, because, you know, everybody's got friends who like beer. All right, let's get into the episode. Today, I am joined with Andy Thompson, owner of Four Priest Brewing over in the UK. So, Andy, if you would, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got into the world of beer, and what you do when you're not talking to people like me about beer. Absolutely. Well, it's great to be here, Rob. Thank you. And I, I would recommend highly liking and subscribing below. I've done that. It's well worth your while, honestly. Um, yeah, so my name's Andy Thomason. Uh, I am um, I, I'm every function at Four Priest Brewery in the UK. Uh, we're a small, very small family-run business. Uh, I do the brewing, delivering, cleaning, accounting, uh, and everything else. We've, uh, we've only been in operation. Actually, we've been brewing since April of of this year, um, so so very recent. Um, the brewery came into existence as a as a business formally uh, on the first of December last year. Um, and as we speak now, it's the early part of December, so we're we're pretty much exactly one year old as a as a legal entity here in the UK. Happy um, birthday, Andy! <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we should get cake or something. Um, yeah, so it's. Um, uh, you know, it's it's new to us. We're learning as as we go. Um, every day is a school day, as they say, and literally we're we're brewing every week and finding out you know better ways to do what we do. Um, we're limited in the styles that we have at the moment um, for reasons that I'll explain in a second. But you know, we we really focus on English cask beer. So My none of this favorite co- none style of beer. <laughs> there, I'm glad to hear it. That's quite unusual talking to a North American. Who right. That. I know. So. I know. I, I'm an anomaly. I love <laughs> cask beers. Uh, and it's it's mainly because the carbonation levels are lower on cask beers, and I can drink a shit ton more of them. <laughs> 100%. That's why I like it. That's why the pubs that we work with like it, because, you know, these are, these are session beers. You know, um, you can... You can sit in a pub or a bar and you can drink, you know, four, five, six pints. And these are English pints, right? Real pints, not little American Imperi- pints. Okay. Imperial oh, pints. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, 20 ounce all the way. And um, and um, and the pubs love that because, you know, there's nothing worse than going into a pub for the for the owner as a, as a, as a customer drinking one pint of 15%, you know, Russian Imperial Stout and then leaving. Yeah. Um, they want you sat there the whole night eating snacks, drinking beer, ordering another round. Um, and spending your whole evening there. So we make beer to enable that uh, to happen <laughs> for, for the pub owners. And it's great. It's great beer. And, and you know, absolutely um, stronger styles are something that we want to move into. Uh, but we really, really what we needed to do was, was to create a strong foundation of regular beer that would work in any pub in the geography here. Um, that's, that's what's going to pay the rent and mean that we'll uh, exist um long enough to uh you know to 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 become you know a permanent uh, a permanent operation so we went into the first year um with, with quite a kind of um we, we were particularly risk averse i think you know it was kind of don't spend anything on anything let's just work with what we've got make a little money reinvest that money back into the business upgrade some of the equipment um and we'll grow slowly. I mean, we're not accepting, we're not expecting a kind of um, rocket ship acceleration in the business because to do that, we would need to invest more cash into it. And at right. this stage, that's that's not part of the program. So, so it started with um, uh, a, a weird coincidence. Um, I'm part of a, a local homebrew group here in in South Cheshire in in England, sort of the northwest of England. If if you're familiar with the map, kind of in between Birmingham and and Manchester, somewhere in between those two, nowhere near London. You can probably tell by my accent, I'm not from the, I'm not from the posh part of the UK, right? Um, right, right. You, 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 um, you, you're not your, you're not your hoity-toity English uh, accent. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't sound anything like Hugh Grant or the royal family. Um, 
<laughs> I'm often uh, I work for an American business in the week, and um, what? You know, I, I, yeah, I have been asked if uh, if I'm Australian or from New Zealand on multiple occasions. So, I'm so, so, so do, do you often go, I blimey, and I'm a Kiwi? <laughs> uh oh, I lost you there for a second. Yeah, yeah you lost me there. Yeah, you froze up for a second. I was like, do you often go like I and blimey, and I'm a Kiwi? <laughs> All the time, yeah. <laughs> Standard. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they can talk. The company that I work for is in Northwest Minnesota, so they talk real funny over there, anyway. Uh, right? They're all know. like, "Hey, there!" And don't you know? <laughs> you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you betcha. That's right. See, yeah. see, no, you got it. You got it. You, you betcha. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I was, uh, yeah, I've been brewing for oh many years, ten years or so. Um, all well, all grain really for probably four years, I would say. Prior to that, extract, um, and prior to that, wine. Um, a bit of a gap um, for a sort of 10, 15 year period um, where I didn't brew anything. And I sort of rediscovered making alcoholic beverages, uh, let's say, about 10 years ago. Um, and more recently, um, I discovered through an internet forum, a, a UK web forum for home brewers, um, that there were actually about 10 or 15 of us within a five, six mile radius of where I live. So we started to get together. We had a WhatsApp group. We would meet, go to the, go to the pub together, do beer swaps, you know, try new recipes out on each other. Um, and we kept, we all became good friends actually. And, um, it was in one of the occasions where we'd all, we'd all met up at a local bar for a few beers. And, um, I'd mentioned on a previous occasion, how I'd love to start a little brewery, but you know, one didn't have the money, two didn't have the experience, three didn't have the time. But you know, it's still it's like every home brewer's fantasy. I think you know, one day I'm going to have my own microbrewery, right? It is every and home I'm, brewer's fantasy. You you are correct. <laughs> and one of the guys in the group, um, his local pub, it's about five miles from here. Um, the guy that owned the pub unfortunately had, had passed away, and um, his wife had sold the business to a new owner who had no interest in, in keeping the, the, the brew house that it was at the back of the pub. They had a, a two barrel brewing system there. Um, he wanted that space back to put customers in. Um, and um, my friend said to me, you should go have a chat with him. And uh, it, it took about 30 seconds for me to say, well, okay, I haven't got any money. I haven't got any time. I haven't got any anything, but I'm going to go look at this kit and see what's what. And um, so I turned up there on a Friday night and um, took a look at it. Um, it's about 10 years old, I guess, this kit. It's, um, if, you, if if any of you have seen the videos, you'll have seen what it looks like, but it's kind of wooden clad in like pine. It's stainless steel, but the vessels themselves are clad in wood and um, they're not pressurated. Um, it's really designed for English cask beer. And um, I'm looking at this kit thinking, I've seen this stuff secondhand for, you know, 12, 13,000, something like that. And I'm um, right. thinking, maybe maybe five i could give him five maybe um and, but maybe i'll start with three and see where we go from there and um before i could even talk price he he, he just said look if you can get it out by sunday just take it i don't need it it's going to cost me money to get rid of it um i've got the construction team coming in on monday they want to knock the wall down um that this um, this equipment was in and like make one larger space in the in the bar um and they can't work around this equipment so you'll be doing me a favor by taking it. So uh, that took me about five seconds to make a decision. I was like, right, I'll be here, here on Sunday morning with a truck. <laughs> right. Um, no shit. <laughs> so four or five of the guys from the homebrew group who were free on the Sunday morning, um, we, uh, they agreed generously to come and help me move this kit. So um, I called my wife's dad and said, cause he works in the transport haulage industry and said, Hey, have you got a truck we can borrow? Yeah. When do you need it? Sunday? Yeah, no problem. I'll be there. Um, well, that's fortuitous. <laughs> so he he arrives in this big um, in this big well, you it would you'd probably call it a van, but you know I would call it a truck because yeah. your cars are bigger than ours, right? But um, right, right, yeah. We have we have giant cars in North America. <laughs> yeah, a, a vehicle big enough to put you know a whole two barrel system in three three vessels plus all the supporting bits and pieces and. Um, so, yeah, we decommissioned this brewery, ripped it out, put it in the truck, and they were like, okay, where am I going to take this equipment? I've got no idea. I'm thinking <laughs> I can get it. I can get it down the side of the house and throw a tarp over it. So I called my wife. She was like, no, do you dare turn up here with that equipment? 
So eventually her dad's driving the truck and I said, do you know any idea where we can go in this truck now with this stuff? He goes, yeah, we can take it to the yard. There's a 40-foot shipping container there and nothing in it. We'll put it in there. So um, so that's what we did. We took it back. We got there. There's a fork truck waiting for us to unload it. He called ahead. Uh, we loaded it into this container. Um, and then I came home and told my wife, really, what, we, what we'd done. And um, uh, she she still to this day doesn't believe I got it for free. She's she's sure that I paid a lot of money for it. I just didn't tell her. Right? So, <laughs> Man, that that is, uh, I mean, I have to say that's amazing that somebody just like, no, I don't want this. Get it out of here. You can have it. I yeah. I would have been all over that like like flies on poop. <laughs> yeah, I I sense now some times past. There's probably a little bit of regret on his part, but actually, you know, I'm, I don't knock it. I don't, I don't. It's not like I feel like I've taken advantage of him at the time. That was not his business model. He wanted, you know, he, people were walking away from his bar on a Friday night because there was nowhere to sit, right? So there's right. money walking no, away no. down the street to the next bar along. So he wanted the space, and I, you know, and I could help him make it happen. So yeah, it was a it was a fair trade as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um, but he could have put a few a few you know, a few K in his pocket as well, but um, he could have, I've, I've been in touch but... since. And, and we, you know, I've talked about supplying him with some beer and I'll do him a deal, but, um, uh, they're on a different direction now. I think they're, uh, they're buying a lot more national beers. They're not, you know, not really focusing on local. It's their, it's their thing. So that, and that's great. Maybe at some point in the future we'll do it. So, so we got this kit and, um, I'm like, right. Uh, I took a video while we were there. Um, just on my phone, never made a YouTube video in my life. Um, and um, put it on the internet for the other 10 guys that couldn't come down to help us move it so they could see the homebrew group, so they could see this kit that we had. Um, and I uploaded it, and I had, I think, 12 views the first day. It was like the homebrew gang and my mom twice. Um, <laughs> uh, and I knew, I knew everybody that had watched it. Um, and I went to bed and woke up. was like, oh, I had like 200 views. It's a bit weird. Okay. Um, and then, um, I made another quick video about a week later when we were looking for, you know, a building to put this kit in. And I was looking at old, where I live here, there's a lot of dairy farming and, um, a lot of the dairies had old fashioned milking rooms, you know, where the machine room, um, right. And, um, the, a lot of them have gone to these big robotic dairy dairies now. So the old milking rooms often are empty and, um, you know, that would be perfect for us. You know, it's hygienic, yeah. there's water in there, there's drainage, everything's great. Um, so yep. I was looking at those and um, I did another video um, and, uh, and all of a sudden I had like 800 views in a couple of days. I'm like, where are these guys coming from? Where are they finding me? And, and actually it was another brewery uh, about an hour from here, um, a, a, another brewery who has a, another YouTube channel um, and he found my video and I'd been talking about it on his channel and he has got like 15,000 subscribers. So everybody came over to, so of to, course, to, see yeah. what, to see what was going on. And then I started getting emails and text messages and you've got to make more videos. You've got to make more videos. Okay. Well, I'll start making some videos then. And they were terrible. The first one's really bad. But then I thought, you know what? <laughs> Mine are great... terrible still. <laughs> <laughs> this is, <laughs> no, yours are good. The, the, <laughs> you know, there's a, you know, I'm, I was thinking, you know, if, I'm about to start a journey here, right? And and there, there are people following behind all the time, and there are people that are you know ahead of me um, on their journey, and um, it would be great just to document it a little bit. So I had in mind maybe once a month just to kind of hey, this is where we're up to. We got a building now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it turned into a weekly thing, and um, we get a couple of thousand uh, views a week now on the on the channel. Um, nice. It's it's become you know niche niche but popular in the. UK homebrewing space anyway. Um, well, more popular than my channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try and help you out with that. I'll go, I'll give you a plug on our channel and send, see if we can send some traffic your way. Right. Um, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, probably three months later or two months later, um, another guy in the homebrew group, I'd been looking for premises. I couldn't find anything anywhere. And, uh, I just happened to be chatting to a guy called Mike who restores, um, old British MG sports cars. He services and maintains some really beautiful old vehicles. And, uh, he had a little industrial space on a, on an industrial estate. Um, you know, these thousand feet units and, um, I said, oh, I'm just really struggling. I can't find anything. And he said, well, the door next to me is empty. I'm like, why, why didn't you tell me this for the last two months? <laughs> right. So I went to see it. 
uh, spoke to the guy that owned the building. We did a deal pretty much within a couple of days um, where it was a one year one year agreement, one year lease, so no long term commitment, and then we just right. roll it from there. So for about the price, a little bit more than I wanted to pay, but that's because I'm I'm tight, I'm cheap. And, no, um, uh, there's nothing wrong but, with being cheap, man. <laughs> and, uh, so we so we did the deal, and then we started to move the kit across. In first um, of December last year, we got the keys, as I think I said earlier. We set the business up, and then it, it took us until April, digging holes, putting in a water supply, you know, making drains, fitting out the electrical stuff, getting the tanks in, test <laughs> brews, caustic brews, making uh, some equipment that was missing. Yeah, we had no HLT, <laughs> for example. The previous um, process was to use the the we call it a copper, I guess you call it a kettle, but you know, to use the, the kettle to boil or warm the water, which is then mm-hmm. transferred into the mash. Yep. Um, and some of it then is retained in the empty fermenter, ready for sparge later. Yep. And it's all like moving stuff around. I was like, I just need a hot liquor tank for this. this I'm going to get confused. Um, so we bought a little bit of, uh, we bought a couple of cheap tanks from Italy. Um, we, drilled them and put heat elements in and temperature controllers um, made some videos on that as well and by um, end of April we were ready to make beer so um, we brewed the first batch um, which was a recipe that I'd previously brewed but not with this it was the same base recipe but completely different hop uh, combination in there and, okay. um, and I also pulled pulled down the alcohol content to meet the requirements from a couple of local pubs and bars who didn't want it at 6.3 or 6.4 or whatever it was. They wanted that, that they wanted the beer at 4.2, 4.1, which is pretty traditional for English cask. I don't know. Um, Those are losers in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you, if you can head over and drink five, six English pints of 6.3, 6.4, um, in an English country pub, you, well, you're not going to get a taxi home, put it that way. You've got a long walk. So, <laughs> you know, um, so, so, so what I'm hearing is, is I'm screwed when I, when, when I come over to visit you and uh, drink beer, because I'm, I'm the guy who's like, what, this is only 6%. I need like 12 of these before I'm hammered. <laughs> you got it. Well, you got a strong constitution. We will sort. We if you do find yourself over here, we'll sort you out with a ride. Don't worry about that. We'll we'll, <laughs> we'll make sure you get from a, a to B, whatever state you you happen to be in. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um. So I had to um. I had to re redo some of the recipes to make them fit. Um. And obviously that involved some trial brews, which I did at home on my homebrew kit to start with while we were still fitting out the brewery. Um. Put some into kegs and bottles to take into the pubs and bars to say hey this is approximately what the finished product will be like what do you think um and they loved it so we were like okay let's just let's just push go so we brewed the first uh the first batch end of april um it was just six uk gallons nine uk gallons six casks we brewed okay. so yep. um and we sold to just two pubs at that stage the two that had sort of helped us along the journey and they had a couple casks each and they sold out in almost immediately you know within 24 hours they'd, they'd done them 72 pints per cask i mean so i was like wow okay there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we found something that people like and then i'm getting untapped reviews so i was like, oh, better set up an untapped account like uh, you know the <laughs> right? reviews i don't even own the you know the four priests um space <laughs> on there i better go get that and uh uh and then the pubs call me again, you know, can, we need a resupply. Bring us more casks immediately. ASAP. I'm like, okay, I'm running out now. We've got to brew some more. Um, but the funny thing was, um, when I first brewed that first batch, um, I wasn't sure. The, the, the challenge with equipment, um, and again, being cheap, was I didn't have any sort of hop filtration um, at that stage. So... When I'm adding the, and we're using T90 pellet hops, right? So I'm throwing them into the boil and then I've right. got to suck it out into the heat exchanger. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was quite concerned about, you know, getting hot, hot matter. Getting it clogged. So, yep. So I thought the, the cheap way to do that is mesh bags. Well, just yep. like a home brewer, you know, equivalent to a kind of hop spider, but these mesh bags. So I've got these mesh bags. There's like a kilo of hops in there and um, split it into a couple of bags, just throw them in. And then at the end of the boil, I can just let them settle out at the bottom and they stay contained in these little mesh bags. Um, and then when we were racking the beer into the casks a couple of weeks later, 
Um, I had a sample, as you do. I was like, I, there's no bitterness. No, there's just no bitterness. I was like, oh, no, we've really messed this up now. So we'll cask it anyway. We'll see how it goes. Um, and I called ahead to the pubs. One in particular, I said, hey, I'm going to deliver this beer to you in a week's time, but I do not want you to serve it until I've been down and tried it with you. Um, and he was like, yeah, I'm cool. That's the first brew. Let's just make sure it's right. Um, yeah. But then I had to go to Las Vegas on business. So I was I was over in Vegas for, um, dreading business. coming home because I, yeah, it was <laughs> business. There's a lot of business <laughs> done there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um, so I'm dreading coming home. Um, and that, that was another episode that I did, like this journey home, trying to get back to the pub in time to try this beer that was sitting ready for me, to, ready for me to test it. But right. what I'd had to do be, shortly before departure, Las Vegas, is I knew I knew I needed to brew the, the second batch. Otherwise, I'm going to have like a month gap with no beer to sell. Right. So I amped up the bitterness, um, and um, I added some early hops into the boil. Uh, Magnum, I think it was, just just to give us some bitterness. Um, when I arrived home and tasted that first batch, it was perfect. Um, and now I'm like, oh no, now the second <laughs> batch is going to be really bitter. It's not going to work. So yeah, shit. you're like, fuck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, how are we going to play this then? So because it was a brand new beer from a brand new brew, we called the first batch. We called it trial batch. <laughs> um, and then the second brew, which was the extra bitter one we called yep. trial badge two <laughs> yeah and then Ooh. we asked yeah i know <laughs> we're creative honestly so so uh, and we gave the customers the opportunity to tell us which one they preferred um and the idea was going to be you know if they pick the more bitter one well we'll just brew that next time and if right. they pick the less bitter one we'll brew that but of course i had to get the third brew on before they tested it so oh, I had to of course kind of pre preempt what they were going to go for i said i think they're going to like the first one and i hope i pray they like the first one and the guy in the pub was like well whatever they pick we'll say it was the first one anyway if you got that's the one you're going to brew we'll just we'll just cheat so anyway as it happens it was the first the first batch was the one that everybody liked i was thank god Woo. for that whoa so and that's the and we have not touched that recipe since it's, it's not moved at all it's exactly the same every time to the gr to the gram the hops to the gram i won't touch it now i don't uh, so that's called um, we call that one Murgy Straight uh, you'll find it on Untapped and some other places I've published the recipe as well if people want to make it um, nice uh, it's uh, and there's actually there's an, quite a number of uh, US folks that have um, that have brewed it now and they sent me photographs of it and they've got the, the hand pull pump in their house or in the garage uh, or whatever it's, I've been um, I've been I've been trying to convince my wife that I need to put a beer engine in the house we've yeah. got our house has a basement and a crawl space. I'm like, the crawl space would be the perfect space to put casks and we could put a yep. beer engine out in the garage and 100%. we could just, yeah, just, Do just it. pump that beer up. And, and, and to her credit, she has not, she has not, um, told me I can't do it <laughs> Yeah. so I think because she uh, loves cask beer as well so oh well there you well it's a no-brainer then right I think you've spoken to you spoken to Billy Carpenter from Gam Dude have you had anything to do with him or yes uh, yes yes yeah he and he and I are friends on the social medias and we, yeah. we were talking yep he's uh he's brewed he brewed Murgy Straight as well um recently so uh he, he's he, he can probably give you his honest opinion on it um he's got he's got the hand pump as well so so yeah, um, so it worked, and and so far, um, that's probably eighty percent of the beer, or seventy percent of the beer, probably now that we sell is is that original, original recipe now. The, the, nice. Uh, every every single time, um, we added shortly afterwards a, a traditional English best bitter again, low four percent territory, um, hopped with good old fashioned English hops in the main, uh, East Kent Golding, Fuggle. Uh, yep. But I finish, I finish it with Styrian Golding um, oh. because it really gives it a, a really, a really nice aroma, and um, uh, you know, without making it overly bitter. I mean, yeah, you know, bitter is a spectrum, right? But you know, mine are, mine are meant to be easy drinkers, smooth, caramelly. Drink five pints, no problem. Uh, You're speaking my you language, know? brother. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that was that, and then um, most recently in cask. Um, I've just got there ready to go next week out to the pubs. We, we sold, 
we made eight. We've sold seven already. Um, so I've got one left, um, which is an oatmeal stout. So you're going to uh, send not... it my way? Well, if, yeah. If you want to, if you want, if you want to pay the FedEx and duty on uh, 70, 72 pints, then be my right. guest. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't be a Hose, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to be cheaper for you to hop on a plane into Manchester. Yeah, and I'll, drive, I'll come yeah, pick you up. Fly yeah. over there, hi, hire a car, drive to I your location. So. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. So, um, and again, we've not tried to overcomplicate it. You know, it's a, it's a pretty simple base recipe um, with uh, um, Crystal 240. I've used Maris Otto as the base malt in that. Um, there's chocolate malt, there's roasted barley, um, and that's hopped with um, uh, Kent Goldings again, but um, Bramling Cross. I don't know if that's one you're familiar with. I don't often see I that am in familiar US recipes. With that one. Okay. I am familiar with that one. Uh, I don't know that a lot of the people who, who actually mm-hmm. watch the show would be familiar with it, but yeah. it's it's a fantastic hop, yes? Yeah, it is. So, uh, And I actually, used a, I actually used malted oats. Um, oh, nice. Which, uh, you know, not so easy to come by and not always everywhere. But I, I really wanted some oatiness to it because I think with a lot of oatmeal stouts, you're left with that silky mouthfeel because of the oats. But yep. the kind of the oat character itself, the flavor is kind of lost. And I really wanted that kind of breakfast oatmeal-y, you know, hint in there at least. You know, it's not like drinking a bowl of porridge, right? But it, it's definitely present. So, um, so that went into cask. Uh, Two weeks ago, um, well, yeah, actually, this is Saturday today, so two weeks ago today, so um, we're almost ready to get those out to the pubs now. And again, I've got the same problem. I haven't actually tasted the finished thing fully conditioned out in the cask yet, so <laughs> um, I've done the same deal with the same guy in the same pub. Look, I'm going to bring this over, but don't give it to anybody until I've tried it, <laughs> so um, so we'll get that delivered. The thing with cask is you got to, when we deliver, we deliver on a Wednesday, Um we will roll the casks to redistribute the finings and the, the yeast yep. sediment around. And then they'll, they've got to sit uh, for two days to, yep. for it all to precipitate out again. I, I use a fining called Brow Sol P, which is a, a German vegan product. I'm not, not a vegan, but you know, it, it, there is a demand for it here. So um, there is, I mean, and it really, um, it really, it really crashes it out fast. So two days in their cellar, then they'll vent it. Um, the kind of, puncture the the container yep. the, the seal in the container to get some oxygen into right. it which is kind of counterintuitive there, yeah. if you're used to new england ipas you don't want oxygen anywhere near it um, <laughs> the opposite is true but obviously we just want to kick start that kind of final little bit of additional fermentation to condition the beer and give it a little sparkle and uh, make it taste nice so um and then they'll tap and serve usually sort of three days three days after delivery three to four days after delivery um, we'll start to see it on the on the tap. So you really got to plan your week. It's not kind of oh we run out of beer, let's put this one on. You got to know a few days in <laughs> advance what right. what you're going to put on. So um, yeah, so um, so that's where we are with that one. Um, we have one keg beer that we do, um, which was um, uh, according to the BJCP guidelines. I didn't know what it was till I'd made it, and then I, it was kind of oh it's an American pale. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> So that's what it is. So it's an American Pale Ale APA of 5.8% um, with a bit of Citra and a lot of Cascade. Uh, nice. Again, not trying to reinvent the wheel, just sort of classic um, yeah. classic combo. Um, Crystal 100, extra pale malt. Um, it's kind of light, a light golden, a light golden color, very light amber color maybe. Um, that's going down quite well. Now, that was our first keg beer. Um you know, served in a pressurized carbonated container. So um, you've gone over was, the dark side. <laughs> yeah, it was quite. It was quite a feat trying to get that from you know get that brewed and into a container. Right when I have no, <laughs> I've got no bright tank. I've got no vessels that will take any pressure whatsoever. So, um, and then uh, you know I can't filter. Uh, I, you know, I, I, so I'm like, okay, it was might be hazy then, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um so uh, we we've worked our way around it actually and we've just found a way you know you've got to be creative and find ways to do it so what we do is we we find in the primary fermenter once the fermentation's finished we'll crush it 
we'll find it twice with two silica based silica based findings in there and i've actually put a little upstand because the the fermenters that we use are a dished bottom rather than a conical okay um so what the first thing that's going to happen when i first put that first keg on uh and open the valve is i'm just going to get like sediment basically so uh, you <laughs> yeah know, you're gonna have a, a little <laughs> yeah, a little little periscope basically inside. It means I'm going to lose maybe a couple of gallons of beer, um, but I got plans for that. You know, later um, we can recover. I can always recover it and bring it home, right? <laughs> so, um, but certainly um, we we managed to get out bright beer, bright flat uncarbonated beer into the kegs, and then we force carbonated in keg, just like you would with a corny keg at home, a Cornelius keg. So yep. we just pr top pressure. Um, left them on for four or five days um, at about, well, because of the ambient temperature, I think it was about 17 or 18 PSI, uh, which gave us 2.4 volumes. Perfect. Yeah. And, th and it worked. Um, so I'm like, okay, I just saved myself a thousand on a bright tank that I didn't need. Right. Um, um, but clearly if we're going to, if we're going to continue to develop more keg beers, we're, we're really going to need a conical fermenter and, you know, maybe a unit tank, something that will take pressure and we can, um, yeah. we can carbonate a bit more, uh, you know, a bit more accurately, I think, but it works. Yeah. I've got, I've got, um, I've got three, uh, chronicle, uh, style conical, uh, fermenters and I've got one unit tank, uh, for my homebrew and, and my stuff. And, and, you know, my, my, uh, my unit tank can do uh 15 PSI and the, the yep. other ones can do like three PSI. So, yep. Yeah. I, I, I get it. I mean, and, and I tend to do like when I do a brew, I'll do I'll do half of it will go into the standard uh, fermenter where it, it can't do any really any yeah. any pressure. And then the other yeah. half will go into the uh, the unit tank, which can do uh, 15 PSI. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. But, you know, uh, a lot of what we're doing, you know, uh, uh, real brewers, I still don't consider myself a real You're brewer. You're a real I'm brewer. A... You, you own a commercial brewery. You're a real brewer. God damn it. Yeah, it's it's psychological, <laughs> I think. You know, I know. Not... Yeah, it is. It is. P people are telling me that. and, uh, and I'm, But I'm, you know, my when I think about brewing, uh, you know, my, my brain works along still the homebrew process, you know. You know, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, right? I got yep. it in my head. But you know, in, yep. in the commercial world of brewing, you know, you you can't do that. Um, you no, know, you, you can't. Gotta, you've got to be quicker to market. But um, you are correct. But we're, you know, that's that's still how we that's still how we're brewing because we're able to brew that way. But you know, as we start to scale a the business, then I'm going to have to look for ways to get things done more quickly. Uh, there's some things I really don't want to compromise on, particularly with cask. It needs to be sat in that cask in my conditioning room at the brewery for two weeks. I, yep. I can't avoid that. Um, I've tried to ship it out um, after a week. It's not ready. Um, you know, some of the pubs will say, fine, well, we'll keep them in our cellar for a week or two. But there's always that temptation for them if they're busy and they're running low on beer. Oh, just, yep. we'll just, just put it on. It. No yep. one will notice. And then that, you know, reflects badly on me then because people won't enjoy the experience. Of right. Beer. So, yeah. And, so then, and then your beer is compromised. Yeah. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, we, we the only bad review that we had so far, touch wood, the only bad review that we had so far was the pub's fault. Um, you know, they, they kept the beer on too long. That's the other thing with cask. If um, if your listeners are, aren't familiar, once you've tapped that cask and you've started to introduce oxygen, oxygen, put my teeth in, oxygen into the, <laughs> into the cask, um, you, 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 the clock's ticking. You know, you yeah. got four, you got four or five days at its best. If I was going to say six, six tops, yeah, but yeah. If you if you're very careful, um, or you maybe use an aspirator where every time you pull that handle to dispense some beer, then air, literally air from the cellar of the goes pub in, is, yep. is going in. So uh, you can get a little aspirator which sits on the um, uh, in this in the system basically. So it's not air that's being sucked in; it's actually beer gas, CO two, or some other gas. Right. To fill the to fill the space, and that that will give you a few extra days as well. But um, one particular pub that we had, um, it was definitely seven, eight, nine days Ooh. without an as without an aspirator. And what you start to get then is um, is kind of a vinegary aroma. Yeah, you start um, you start to get balsamic vinegar. Yeah, it's 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 stale at that point. Um, yeah, and again, depending on the the bar staff that are employed there, you know, if they're experienced people, they'll they'll know. Um, but often, you know. They're not. They're, well, that's the know. problem. Is 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 often they are not experienced and they don't yeah. know. 
yeah uh and we we've had we've had that before you know as you get to the towards the bottom of a cask as well um once you're down to the last couple of pints you'll notice what was previously a really bright clear beer and our beer is designed to be served crystal clear um you'll start to pick up some of that bit of sediment out of the bottom of the cask and there's time to stop then you know you'll always have some wastage in, yeah. in, a, in a cask but again some of the pubs just keep on pulling the handle because it's just money um, right right yeah and they're more concerned about the cash than they are about the actual quality yeah or you know the person that's pulling the pulling the pump just doesn't have the experience to, to recognize that actually i've just pulled this pint it looks completely different to the one that i pulled before and yeah. maybe there's a question i should ask so you know we, we know where these places are and um you know i i I don't go, I don't push beer in their direction. If they want to buy it, then that's fine. But, you know, I, I, there's certainly a conversation about, you know, do they need any help from me to ensure right. it's kept correctly, which kind of, you know, it pisses them off a little bit, I think, sometimes because I'm kind of telling them how to do their job. But ultimately, I'm the guy that gets the bad reviews, not them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, it's your product that's getting reviewed. So, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. your it's your prerogative to, uh, to yeah. be like, hey, if you want my reviews or if I want my reviews to be best, this is the way you should serve this. Yeah. I get it. There's a smaller version of the, the, the standard cask that we use is, as I said, is nine um, imperial gallons. I don't know what that is in us gallons, but it's, it's 41 uh, liters. If we're trying to find a, yeah, that would be, that would be what 41 liters would be about. Uh... Oh shit. I can't do math right now. I've had too much to drink today. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I Google it? Yeah. <laughs> Nine UK gallons <laughs> in US gallons. Right. Uh, nine UK gallons in US gallons is, I can't even type it straight because I've been drinking vodka. It's 10.8. Right. Um, there you go. US it's 10, gallons. It's, there you go. 10, it, it's 11 gallons US. <laughs> right. So uh, you can buy a half size cask, um, which is called a pin over here pin um that's probably more suitable for some of these pubs i think where maybe they just don't have the custom to get through 72 pints you know over a weekend effectively that's what they need to do so um, you know what i call those people i call those people <laughs> slackers because i can go through 72 <laughs> pints in a weekend there you go <laughs> american pints right yeah it's easy um <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so um so we need to get some pins the problem with them is they're hideously expensive they get stolen from the pubs all the time because they make great little kind of fire pits and things and yeah you, you know you never get them back so um we're just a little bit cautious about that um but yeah um so, so that's the range that we have so we got the we got the pale the murgy straight um we've got the bitter which is called most and dragon named after a local legend around here Nice. And then we got we got the stout, the, the oatmeal stout, which is called Cross Stout, um, alongside Cross stout. the Ameri the uh, American Pale, and that sort of completes the lineup for now. I do have on test downstairs here at the house um, a, um, a, a an IPA, um, which was uh, what hops did I put in that now? Simcoe. Um, I don't even remember. It's a couple of weeks now. I need to check. <laughs> Fruit, fruity hops. It was a pure experiment. I'm going to keg it and just see what this hop combo works like. Um, we've not done an IPA, and I've not made an IPA at home for years. So um, I really need to just um, understand the bitterness and whether it suits the local palate. Right. I don't want it. Right. So what is your to... home? What is your home setup like? My home setup now is is basically um, a kit that I built from scratch. Um, I've been sitting watching videos online, a lot of US um, YouTube videos, and I came across an organization called Claw Hammer Supply. Yes. And um, Claw Hammer Supply did this um, all in one mesh basket system. Yep. And uh, I Claw love Hammer that. Makes, thought... they make, Claw Hammer makes a great kit. If it, you're looking do... to, if you're looking to get into home brewing, if you're looking to, to just be like, I want to make my own beer, Claw Hammer makes a great kit. Yeah, and um, I ended up ended up chatting to um, to the guys there um, about the electrical supply required for their kit because I'm over here in Europe and we're right. we're 240, 230, 240 volts, but it's different than your 230, 240 volts. Yours is a split <laughs> split is. phase system. We're not split right. phase here, right? So um, right. I'm like, how can I make that work? And we we agreed. Um, Emmett, I think it was that I spoke to. It is Emmett. I think his name is. Um, 
And we were like, now nah, this is just too complicated. You know, I, I'm going to blow my house up. I'm going to sue them. You know, so things will go wrong. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I didn't buy it, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to make one. I'm going to make one. So I bought a, I bought almost the same kit that they use because pretty much their kit is made from off the shelf stuff. Yes. It's all tri clamp. Yep. The heating, the heating elements that they put in are, um, are standard tri clamp heating elements. Um, the basket was the real difficult thing because you know you need clearance below the basket for right. the heating for the heating element um, and for for flow. Yep, exactly. So and all the baskets that I found had this little one inch standoff. It would sit right on the bottom of the of the cop of the kettle. Um, so um, I, I found one that had these little one inch standoffs, and then just got some stainless steel hardware, stainless steel bolts and nuts drilled and made an extension for the legs so it would stand off off the bottom um i discovered the uh, the controller that they use was a branded version of um uh, of a chinese manufacturer's uh, controller which they they have printed with all their logos and everything and uh, yep. i ended up speaking to their technical guys and they said they did a 240 year old version and um i could buy it so i've got like a black version of their you know of their silver one that, that you see in the in the videos that they have is almost the same um and then the pump that i bought which is um the magnetic uh mp15 pump that they use on their kit uh yep. th that again was 110 120 volts so i found a 240 volt version of that so i basically built a 240 volt version of, the, of their kit so um and that's what i've been using at home for a couple of years um and uh, i get a lot of questions about it because everybody assumes how did you get a claw hammer kit in the uk i'm like it's not um when i've done videos so um and uh, you know and i'm uh, if you're in the uk or europe and you really like that claw hammer kit you've got no choice but to either go to the us um bring it back or have a yep. friend in the us or, or canada i guess and um, get them to forward it on to you or something um and then you've got the problem of everything's the wrong voltage you're gonna have to swap right. the kit get the kit out right anyway. yeah <laughs> yeah you got you got to replace half of the shit in it yeah. because it's the wrong voltage yeah but it, it was uh, it was a pain to build i mean drilling all the holes in the tank and it, just a nightmare the whole thing it took weeks to get it all ready so you know i strongly recommend if anyone's in the us or north america just buy it from claw hammer it will save you a lot of pain um, yeah and like i said claw hammer makes a, a fantastic kit yeah. um before i bought my system i'm um, here in canada claw yeah. hammer's not available in canada but um that I looked at their stuff and I was like, "Oh, that's what I want," but yep. you know, I had to I had to outsource it to someplace else because yep. I couldn't get it. That's it. So I brew on that. Prior to that, I had um, it's kind of a, a um, uh, over here in Europe, it's uh, referred to as a, a brew devil, and there's there's other brands, but basically, it's a kind of generic thirty liter all in one with the mash pipe with the perforated. Yep perforated um false bottom in it there's a number of different brands a bit like a kind of mash and boil i think you have over there is it mash and boil is it called something like that yeah um, we've got like robo brew and we've yeah, got uh, grain father yeah. and things like yeah. that yeah yeah the grain father is the sort of and that's available here again in in the right voltage because yep. um uh, yeah they make some, it in they make it in both us and uk voltages yes yeah <laughs> so um you know that would have been the the one that I would have gone to. I think were I not to have done the claw hammer because it is kind of it's the cream of the crop. I think it is. It yeah, no, they make way. fantastic kit. Yeah. So yeah, so I use that. So that that allows me to brew. Um, um, I tend not to go above about thirty liters um, typically on a brew at home. That allows me to fill one uh, one Cornelius keg, five gallon keg, yep. and some bottles. Um, it's not quite big enough to do a full cask because I need 41 liters and um, right. with boil off and the green, you know, I'd have to kind of, uh, you know, lick a back to, to, in order to fill a, a keg, a cask, I should say completely. So I could probably fill a 30 liter keg just um, if I wanted to keg it, but really it's just for prototyping. Um, I don't often brew just for fun at home anymore <laughs> you know there's always a uh, something in mind like you know can it's a sample recipe a trial recipe i'm just testing a hop combo uh, yep. and it's it's probably one probably once a month i'll uh, i'll be brewing something downstairs in the kitchen and filling the house with steam again just like the old days right making the house whole house smell like uh like 
what malt tea <laughs> um yeah it's the best smell in the world though isn't it it obviously. is it, it really is you, you like you you come home you're like oh yeah <laughs> yeah I have people. I have people walking into the brewery on a Saturday morning. It's like nine a.m. The mash is well underway, and um, I I really take great care not to let the smells of the brewery get out because you know we're surrounded. <laughs> we're in a sort of semi-residential area, so uh, what I didn't want to do is get into trouble with the locals with like you know all the smell and steam and noise going out of this yes. place. You know, it's detriment to the environment, the community, and all that. So I'm just trying to be a good neighbor. So I keep the door shut. Um, but the building's got holes in it everywhere. So of course, and, and, and I'll get people coming in and they'll poke the head around the door. Oh, what's that smell? It's amazing. You know, I'm like, come over. Let me show you. Yeah. <laughs> come, come, come have a beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's often not beer available because it tends to go into the kegs and sealed up and put in the, um, put in the cold right. store. So, you know, the next big step for us, I think is going to be, well, there's two things that we need to think about. One is, um, you know, direct sale to the consumer. So whether that's in the form of a brewery tap room, we barely have space. Uh, I made a video today just just talking about that. We we probably could get, you know, a dozen people in there. I think it wouldn't be a, a busy bar. Um, and I just don't have the time to run it more than a couple of nights a week. You know, maybe Friday and Saturday evenings we could do something. Right. But, but bottling or canning, I think, is um, probably an easier route to market for us because we've got a, you know, a significant, population around here of beer drinkers and many drink at home and the idea of being able to buy beer direct from the brewery delivered to your house uh by my son <laughs> in his car <laughs> uh, that i think Get is out uh, there, deliver that beer <laughs> yeah exactly i think that's um that's quite a tempting proposition so um I've, I've got the bottling gear ready to do some test bottling runs i just need to get a pallet of bottles and some labels and some caps and uh, we'll get at least, um, you know, we'll get at least a couple of hundred bottles done as a test and see how they go, I think. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Andy, we have been talking for 46 minutes. And this is the part of the show where I say, hey, this is the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Well, if you, need, if you need to edit anything down, be my guest. Oh, I'm sure no, you no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm I'm really I'm I'm really against editing because the whole premise of my show is supposed to be like two people talking about beer, yeah. and where it goes it goes. But I try and keep it below an hour, so we're yeah. at forty six minutes. I think that's a good time to uh to uh end the show. Sounds so. Good. Um, if people are looking for you on the socials, where can they find you, Andy? Well, if it, all the links to the socials, probably best to head to the website. You can click on all the links from there, which is uh, all the W's, four priests, uh, that's F-O-U-R, priests.co.uk. Um, on there, you'll find a link to uh, Twitter, Facebook, and, of course, the YouTube channel um, where we're, we're four priests brewery on there if, uh, if you'd rather go direct. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, everyone, um, this has been me listening to Andy talk about his fantastic <laughs> brewing experience. And it has been fantastic. I love, I love hearing stories like this where, where people just like randomly get into brewing. And, and I mean, having someone give you a two barrel kit is a fantastic way to get into brewing. Um, no kidding. I'm, I'm Rob from the internet. Cheers. I'm Andy from England. Cheers.